is the best time that we've had for one of these events. This is the third one in the series of conversations we've had, and this is by far the best time we've had. So thank you all for coming for this. I'm Greg Harris. I'm the assistant curator here at the DePaul Art Museum. Can you hear me okay? okay. Um, before we get started with Paul, I wanted to just make a couple announcements about some upcoming events that we have. On February 23rd, we'll have a video screening of uh, video work by Chicago artists that's being hosted by Chi Jang Yin, who's on the art media and design faculty here at DePaul. And then on February 27th, we'll have a panel discussion about art and communities, which is hosted by Joanna Gardner Huggett, who's a member of the art history faculty also here. Both of those events will be in this room, and they start at 6 o'clock. <laughs> So, I'm going to forego an introduction of, of you because I think some of the, the, the tidbits of your resume will come out in the conversation, so we'll, we'll skip that part. I'll send it. We don't want to just reach out. Be sure to speak up. Greg, you need to speak up. Okay. So, I wanted to start by talking with I want to thank everyone for coming out. I think it's it's a, an honor to have so many people here. It's really a pleasure to be here. This is a, a great museum. It's a great show. Um, and I want to thank Greg for putting me in the show. I consider Greg to be one of the uh, promising young curators on the scene. So it's uh, an honor to be talking to you again. Uh, Greg and I talk, do talk on occasion. <laughs> it's a very kinetic version of, like, you know, inside the actor's studio. <laughs> um, we talk a lot on occasion, but, you know, usually not with so many people listening, and maybe half as many. Uh, but usually we have something like this going on there. I don't know if this breaks any rules, but... Okay, that's the box. Um, we can do that later. But anyways, thank you, and I look forward to talking again. I think one of the things that makes our conversation so much fun here is that um, uh, you may not know Spud right, but he is, is, was, is, still, you haven't shown me for years, many years, but was a great photographer. Um, and so coming to curate from that side of the table is, is a great thing, I think. Um, and it's, it makes you kind of a throwback, we were talking about this. As um, a lot of curators come from the academic side of income. Uh, David, you know this. That day when photographers were also curators is a good thing. So, thank you. I actually met Paul in a documentary photography class that I took at Columbia College when I was a junior or senior uh, in college. And it was, a, it was one of the best classes I ever took. And what I found really interesting about it was the different ways that Paul thought about documentary photography, which is you know, such a common medium in the history of photography, and it's something that a lot of ink has been spilled on, but it's still not totally fleshed out. There's a lot of things to talk about with documentary photography. So I wanted to start, I wanted to start there. So what, from your perspective, are the expectations for documentary photography? Those expectations are, uh, are varied and they have evolved historically, culturally. I mean, that's a very. Um, we, I had this class this morning, the class that we were in, and we just started off. And, um, and the thing I try and do with that class, I don't know if you remember, is try and disabuse people of the notion that documentary is one thing. That um, And what makes that class interesting to me, what makes that word interesting to me, is that it's a. Um, you know, it's a really constantly evolving concept that involves different ideas of what evidence is, what the world is, what truth is, you know, what those mediums are capable of actually telling us about any of those things. You know, we thought photography could do something. We grow disillusioned with the, the true evidentiary uh, abilities of photography. I, myself, went from thinking completely traditional terms about that work to completely disavowing any use of that word around my work, and I've done all of the map on it myself. They're very subjective uh, versions of it, and now what makes it 
particularly interesting is there are a lot of really interesting conceptual ways of thinking about that with photography. So you have someone like uh, Paul Graham. Uh, does anyone know his work? Um, you know his work, right? Um, whose pictures, I think, are as much about the space between the pictures, what those pictures can't really show the world, as much as they are about what they are in fact showing of the world. You know? So I, I think it's a lot of things. People bring different expectations to it. Um, I think when you say, uh, think of the documentary photographer, I think I can almost imagine in your heads now a Dorothy Lang migrant mother picture or, or uh, you know, Walker Evans picture. But that's very narrow, very traditional, and I think um, kind of a um, confined way to think about it. You know? uh, in my own work, I mean, forgive me, but this may be a one question kind of interview. In my own work, um, I have very kind of, I don't think about that word at all. No. I think as a work uh, has any kind of documentary value, it is inadvertent. You know, it's kind of a cumulative thing, and it comes just with doing this thing that I almost do with all my projects. Now, you're going to slide through a bunch of things, but. With almost everything I do, uh, I don't care. Uh, but whatever I do, I tend to tend to spend years and years doing it. Um, uh, and this, and this flower you work, this work here, which started actually with this picture, uh, I didn't know I made this picture that I would be spending 14 years in this neighborhood. You know, um, I mean, I keep showing up beyond the point where it's way polite. You know. Uh, you know you know, I show up and I show up some more, I show up some more, and I just keep showing up. When I did the men's club things, I uh, was in, I would be at this club every night, every night, every Friday night, uh, for over a year, you know. Uh, the work I'm doing now, in the west side, I've been working on for seven years, and I was photographing all day yesterday, you know. Uh, I photographed there two or three times a week, and I just do it a lot. So I go in with all kinds of expectations, uh, assumptions, uh, they all get disabused uh, or rectified, and then, um, you know, it, it, somehow in the end I've made a kind of document. But I never go in it with, in the traditional sense of the word where you think you have an agenda. This is the truth, this is the whole truth. But I'm going to talk about this place with these people, this community. I need to, you know, have a checklist of things that I do. I only photograph what's interesting to me. Period. Does that make sense? <laughs> So it's not documentary, then how would you describe it? What's, a, what's another term you use, or another way of approaching the photographs you make? This is, the, this is the problem that we have when we talk about pictures, is that we think there is a term, or a phrase, or a genre that we can easily fit all these things into. Yeah, uh, this is something I can think lately. But I feel like I'm engaged in the verbal Yeah, I'm not engaged in the verbal arts. There are two, two different systems of expression and communication. And to think that the verbal lives, I mean, we're very talkative. Of, as, of all these species, we're the most talkative because we talk about everything, right? Um, so we, I think with that is presumption that, that there is always a kind of verbal equivalent for, for everything, for music, for theater, for, you know, uh, photography, painting. And there isn't. I mean, I don't think, there, I don't think there's one way, I, I don't want to be evasive, but I don't think there's one way to talk about it. This is why I like this, because there is a handy quote actually I just read by Ezra Pound. And it's kind of it's kind of says that. It says, the image is more than an idea, it is a vortex or a cluster of fused ideas, and it is endowed with energy. I mean I think if work is interesting, it's lots of ideas. You know what I mean? Um, if it's confusing, it's confusing. It's not clear about anything. But um, it, it, what an image should do, what a body of work should do, is offer a kind of variety of ex uh, experiences and insights. Right? Makes sense. So I can't, I, I mean, that's why I have trouble with the word documentary. Because you could say, yes, I deal with documentary issues. I do. It's certainly, if you're going to tag my work, you might tag it with that word and it would deal with those kinds of things. But um, I don't think that's all it is. Like the new work, the work I'm working now, I feel, is has more to do with collaboration than me coming in with a kind of set of, you know, every evidentiary kinds of ideas about that place. You know? And so, what it becomes is something. I mean, if if a, if a project's interesting, it's always changing. 
you know, and I'll keep saying this to Pascal, if, if you come to the end of it uh, with what you expected to get at the beginning, it's, it's uninteresting, it's still born. You know, it's, it's a dead idea. Um, it should never be at the end what you think it is at the end. So you should be surprised. You know? <laughs> what are some of the, the tropes they use to get beyond these? Sorry, I flashed that question when I started. What are some of the what are some of the techniques that you use to get beyond the tropes that are conventionally associated with with documentary photography? Well, it's again time. You know, if if you do something for a short amount of time, you're going to do you're going to be functioning under those kind of superficial understandings you have of the thing that you're doing, right? Um, if you once you're surprised, you have superseded those tropes. You've made a picture that you haven't made before. Um, then it feels like it's it's the work is telling you something that you didn't expect, and then it's got it starts to have a life of its own. So you build this big. It's like a, a bush gone wild. All these pictures I'm having, and the problem I have with working that way, because I don't work in a very kind of predetermined way, it, and I work very intuitively, I feel like this is the right place, you know, I, I feel like this is a good day, I, why this street, that street, you know, why this person, why do I stop my car, talk to this person, not that person. Um, I let that run for a long time. But the problem with working that way is I'm stuck with a pile of pictures, you know. Um, really, a lot of pictures, and then it's like doing bonsai. You know, what does this thing want to do? You know, what does this body look want to be? You know, and then you start trimming stuff away. You know? <coughs> does that make sense? I mean, and then if then you you know then if you see you repeating yourself, then you then you are falling into like the noble poor person trope. Kind of thing. You know, they're easy to see because <laughs> they look like other other bad pictures. You know. And the hard thing is, how do you not make that picture? You know, how do you make that picture that you haven't made yet, that you don't know what it looks like? You stop by just not letting yourself make that picture again. You know, I know what that picture looks like. It's not bad to make a bad picture, a picture that's even unfair to your subject. You just don't show it. But, you know, you learn from that. You know, and it's a, it's a very organic kind of thing. So make, am I answering Yeah, that? you are. You're, you're free to follow up there. <laughs> So I want, I, you touched on something that I find really fascinating for the way you work, in that you, you photograph a lot and you take, well, you take a lot of pictures, you, you make many pictures, you make pictures from, in, in the same area for years and years, you know, seven, eight years in the case of current work, 14 years in the case of Mario. So I'm interested in, in how you get started on a project, how you get started, one, on a project in general, but then on, like, on any given day that you go out to photograph. How do you, how do you begin a day for that? You decide, it's like, um, it's your job. This is my job. And you have days you have to go to work. I have days I have to teach. I don't decide not to teach that day. It's my job. I have days that are set aside to work. That's my job. I show up. You know, um, I don't care if I don't feel like it. I show up. You know, if I don't go to work, I don't get work done. So that's how I start. I mean, you try and be that discipline. Um, <clears throat> So I'm very protective of at least two days to shoot, and at least another day to kind of do something related to that. That I go in these printing digits where I can be in the, literally in the dark room, if you can believe that, um, for a couple of weeks, you know. Um, but how do I get started? Again, I back into projects. I mean, I, um, I, think I try and photograph all the time, all kinds of things all the time. And, you know, I make pictures like the first picture you saw that the, I call the blue boy, this kind of very kind of ambiguous aggressive picture. That does, that's not part of any project. That's a picture I made because I went out that day to photograph. Yeah. And um, I, I mean it's 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 it it has it exists on its own and it's fine. It's a simple picture. Not every picture has to be part of a large project. But when you do that, sometimes you you come across pictures or places that makes you feel like, you know, there's more here. I should go back. Like, I never intended to do this work. I never intended to work 14 years in, in closing a little bit away from that yard. I never, that was never a plan. That's insane. You know, to have that as a plan. Um, when I was driving down Lake Street once um, <clears throat> to come into town from Oak Park, uh, I was enamored with just that, that uh, Lake Street L, you know, the green line. 
Um, I mean, that's this amazing architectural phenomenon, I think. It's like this, this uh, monument to the Industrial Revolution. You know, and it's just so loud, and I mean, your buildings feel like they're going to fall out and you drive them in. And it just goes forever, and it's like a cathedral of steel. It's, it's such a beautiful thing. And that was my, my first feeling about that. You know, I make some pictures, but being more interested in people as I always am, I started photographing the folks around. Right? And so and I made some pictures I like. I made, I don't know if you had it, the picture of the woman with the red dress sitting under. You know, you, you, you make a picture you love, and you want to, your, my goal is simple, is to make as many pictures I love as possible in my life. <laughs> no. and, uh, and, and if you feel, it's like fishing. If you, if every fisherman, if he, if he strikes a good someplace, he's, he's, he's going back. And that's what I do. I go back, and it's the whole life I had of Jesus Smith. You know, images. So, I, again, but you know, I, then after a year or two of, of making one picture that feels like it's building on another, and I feel like uh, I'm growing as, as a photographer, because that's the ultimate goal, personally, is to get better all the time. Um, then you have to start thinking about, really, what is this thing you're doing? How do you wrap two sentences around it? How do you describe it? You know? And so, the way I describe this, that Mario work, Changed the ball for year to year. I mean, I have all kinds of ways of talking about it. I've had all kinds of ways of talking about this new work, and I'm, I'm still trying to catch up intellectually with what I'm doing. I think, you know, instinctually. Um, that's not a very common way for, uh, I think, a lot of photographers to work this day. Uh, this, and, this is and I think it has to do with uh, the fact of the fact that people like me in school teaching and always asking, so what are you doing? What's your plan? So people end up having ideas about what they're doing uh, ready before they should be talking about their work, you know? <laughs> um, so I try and give people some wiggle room because I give myself a lot of wiggle room, you know? Um, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. How do you know when you've got that point? Like when you've got a project for lack of better words? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I really only had that I hope in my life as make as make as a project. I really only have about four things I would call projects in the traditional term where they all have kind of similar subject matter. But I think there's ways of slicing through the work. Um, and you know and there could be other things that are ways of looking at this work. I think you could jumble all my pictures up and it's one body work. Really. You know, I'm just adding limb by limb, you know. Um, because I think they're all related. I think all of these uh, bodies of work related. I, um, you know, when I have individual pictures, like you see, that are kind of in between, those are like hair follicles. <laughs> you know, I've got a couple, I've got two arms and two, two legs so far. I've got four bodies of work, you know. And, um, and they're all related because they're all humans, right? They're all, they're all part of the same population, you know. We like to think of, we like to divide all of these humans up into different groups and call them different things. But uh, I don't think they are. I think they're one big, massive humanity. So I'm actually working on a larger project. When I photograph every person on the planet, maybe I can't go. It's about as well as all the same. I want to back up a little bit. Talk about how you started photography. You came out of kind of a, an unusual point. So I wonder if you could talk about your your early career as a photographer, your early experiences with photography. I was my high school year for photography. <laughs> uh, now, really, it started with um, with uh, my father, who was um, a, a passionate, you know, amateur. I mean, I, he had this, this great larger in the basement and the whole thing. And um, it's so I, um, you know, I my, really, my only real lessons in photography, you know, how-to lessons were with my father. You know, this is how you develop a picture print. You got to give me my first camera. Um, you know, I lived in a house where there are like 
20 by 24 inch prints that he made in the basement of, of, of things, as well as members of the family. I mean, that's kind of how it started. And, and you know, I went to a very academic college. I never really, I never went to art school. You know, I never took, it didn't, actually the school didn't even have any art classes. There was like a token painting class, and I took two of them. And that's, that's my background. And then after a couple of years of being out of school, I applied to grad school. But, you know, when I, where I went to grad school, which was at Yale, there was no one was giving you any help on anything. It was, you know, show up every, every week for a print, and, you know, and, um, and then lick your wounds for a week, you know, um, which was really great for me. Actually, I loved it. Um, but, I, you know, I, again, I kind of come into photography the old-fashioned way, through the back door of helping form and train. And so I didn't have anyone like myself telling me what I should be doing, which was, so that meant, like, early on, I did a lot of great stuff that um, I would never let my students do. <laughs> 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 like what? I got these, I got a series of pictures of, uh, in, of diptychs that I made with infrared film that I used all the oil paints on. I had a whole show of that stuff. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll never be seen by anyone. But, you, did, you did this while you were yet? Uh, no, this is while I was. Out of the out of tweets, you know, never get to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got some punishment, but I'm not an asshole. Um, so you know, it's it's again, it was uh, it, it was like I, I you know, in, in the end, no matter what happens, I feel I don't want to sound like Blue Berry, but I feel like the lucky guy the planet because I turned what was kind of a hobby um, into a, a career, kind of so called. Um, <clears throat> You know, when you can do that, I think it's, it's pretty great. You know, I mean, I, when I was at, I went to a very academic undergraduate, and, and to avoid writing papers and stuff, I would go and photograph. You know? um, so I'm doing the thing that I really want, you know. I'm doing the thing to avoid being at a desk all the time, you know? So. So portraits are clearly the, you know, the thing that you do best. So, do we have a show of hands here? Because <laughs> there's a landscape that you guys bought. <laughs> right around the corner. But I have a portrait here. We also kind of does have portraits along with that one. So. so, how did you get started taking pictures of people when you were just starting out with portraiture? What was your approach? <clears throat> Well, you know, actually, I went through this uh, it's an interesting question because I went through this. I had to teach myself a lot of stuff. Uh, and the reason why photography is I would remind my grad students all the time, why do you think you need to be here? Everyone we talk about didn't go to school to photography. And they certainly don't have masters in photography. So what's so essential about going to graduate school in you know, photography? We're asking that question. I'm not trying to chase them out right now. But, um, <clears throat> you know, um, the thing that's uh, wonderful about photography and why the history is, is it's got its disproportionate relative to the other histories of other visual arts, the number of women in it, is photography is easy. It's an easy thing to do. It's an easy thing to learn. It's, it's, it's easy to make good pictures. Yeah, it's impossible to make great ones. You know, um, and so it's easy to kind of be on your own and uh, figuring stuff out. Uh, I, you know, I didn't need someone to teach me how to uh, figure ground and light drawing and plaster casts and all that stuff. But, um, and I mean, that actually, one of the hardest things to kind of wrap your head around formally is color. But I had that one painting class, or two painting classes, which was a revelation to me in terms of what, what color is. So that's the one piece of like real art instruction I got that I really uh, was grateful for. In, 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 Think about all the time, so, uh. Did you ever work in black and white? Yes, of course. You know, and so I, I did landscape work forever. You know, and when uh, when I my grad school was all landscape photography. And I think I, you know, I was looking at people like uh, Evans and Ajay a lot, and and I loved that work, and I spent a lot of time thinking about the landscape. And I had this notion really that um, you could divide the world of photographers into two camps. <coughs> simplistic false dichotomy here, but you know, one, those who are just naturally better at landscape or non-moving things, and those who are really better at pixel, mm -hmm. you know, so you have Tommy Grisson, you know, those things really mediocre at landscapes, and you have Walker Evans, who actually a lot of his portraits are pretty flat and dull, he has a couple of, a couple of corkers, as my father would say, but you know, in general, 
Uh, you know, let us know. Uh, praise famous men. It's, it's great. Uh, uh, Subway series men are called. You know, that's pretty true. But in, in general, you know, and I thought my, I was firmly in this other time. But frankly, I was always looking out of the corner of my eye at Versailles and at Cote de Versailles and thinking, you know, just, it was like, it was, to me, it was like, how the hell did, did Beethoven compose that symphony? It's just so, it, it, when you think about that, that kind of human accomplishment, it, 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 uh, or, uh, you know, uh, Raphael painting or something, or those, I mean, those kinds of accomplishments just seem beyond comprehension. It's like, it's like trying to wrap your head around infinity. I mean, it's just, it's kind of mind-blowing. I used to think that those kinds of pictures were, were like that. How do they make all those things happen? In a split second of a you know of an instant, uh, formulate color, space, all those great things that you expect from the landscape are all just as important as a great picture of a person. But they have this subject who's it's just fascinating and it's so dramatic. And how do they get it all right without pre-planning anything? You know, so I was always admiring that. Um, so when I think in, in retrospect, I, I'm not to go too long about this, but I was teaching myself about form by looking at the landscape. I was teaching myself about light, color, space, you know, how to create a kind of emotional space just with this, out of, out of a piece of paper. You know, that's what a picture is, it's a piece of paper. How do we how do we get all of that out of it, you know? Um, and then in grad school, I, what really helped was I was in grad school and I saw classmates of mine trying and failing, trying and failing. I'm like, if they're gonna try and fail, I'm not gonna try trying to fail. And I proceeded in a, uh, on a two year um, roller coaster where I think I set the record for the most number of bad pictures in a two year period. Uh, I mean, I made every kind of bad picture of a person you can imagine. But I, um, you know, I just met, I also meant something to me. And, um, and, you know, I got into it and couldn't get out. So. How'd you finally cry? <laughs> <laughs> I never, I mean, I'm still trying to cry, you know. Um, I mean, the thing that I'm really interested in doing, the thing I, I find still magical about a picture is that it's so flat, you know? It's, it's crazy that we imbue so much emotion and uh, uh, we, especially documentary, we put so much documentary weight on, on this, this piece of paper, which is just an incredible piece of paper. You know, that kills me that we can look at that. I sh I'll show a picture of my citizen class of a, uh, a fierce dog to my cat, you know? And my cat will look at the picture and not react. You know, we're the only, we're the only species that will look at a picture and get all of this stuff out of it, you know? Um, so the thing that, that kills me is that when you make a picture of a person, you know, which is still ink on a piece of paper, how do you get that sense of uh, tangible psychology? I mean, that kind of thing that, you know, uh, Dawei and I would talk about called uh, the presence of the sitter. They're not there. It's ink on a piece of paper. How can they feel like they're in the picture? And it's not just um, description. It's not just verisimilitude. It's not just what it looks like it. Because you can make a lot of pictures of a person and they are just emotionally flat, right? Um, most pictures will not honor their center. Left to their own devices, they will be a sheer, two-dimensional, meager version of it, right? We're all way more interesting than most pictures, right? But how do you get a picture that feels like it's looking right back at you? When you walk past it on the wall, it's like it's demanding your attention. I mean, that's the, that's the itch I keep trying to scratch to make a picture of people. And that's why, you know, I think that, um, you know, the pictures have changed. They, they all look like pictures of people, but that the way of making these pictures has, has changed over time. I mean, I started with, uh, like what? I started with a small camera, a, a Leica in 35. And, and I moved through various medium format cameras for a long time. Like all that audio work is, is medium format. But now I'm using a view camera. And that, these were all view cameras. And that really, that really changes things quite a bit, actually. You, you can't tell right off the bat that that's a view camera picture. But if you, you know, uh, if you look, this is this is really what I'm trying to get back to. This is one of the first picture I made in Filson, and it's a, it's a medium format camera, but it's on a tripod, which changes this whole dynamic. Just as soon as you set up a tripod, 
it builds in all this kind of time for a different kind of interaction to happen. So there's a few pictures like this in that body of work, and what I'm doing now is actually trying to just make work like that. So it's, does that make sense what I'm saying? I, I, would, I would actually encourage any of you, if it's totally confusing what I'm saying, please ask a question. You know, don't read it all to it. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. I mean, we'll have a time. I know this is, your, this is your house. <laughs> so I want to talk about Barrio. This is, this is the first picture you made. Right? So how did, how did you start photographing this in the little village? Same serendipitous way, you know. I was visiting a friend in Halsted, which is not really built in this little white car that kind of ran through it. Jay Wilkie's, actually, an open mind. And, um, and I had my car, and I had time, and I was going to photograph. And I was down there, so I went down 18th Street. And um, I'm going to really romanticize this here. Put okay? so, <laughs> your buckle your cynical seatbelts here for a second. Um, and it's like, you know, I remember that day like it was yesterday. It was 1988 when that happened. Um, you know, I knew, I, I think I was, I, I didn't know what I was looking for, but I definitely was looking for a kind of drama and theatricity in my, in my picture. Um, and suddenly I'm driving down the street and almost everything I think I need seemed to be there, seemed to be available. It's like, and it wasn't like anything particularly dramatic was happening. It was like, it had as much to do with the light and the color of that space. It seemed like the stage was set, you know? And uh, in this kind of human theater was going to happen. I just, the only thing I had to do was to be there. And, and, and the, the, being there was going to be good, being there a, a lot was going to be better, being there all the time was going to be best. So that was my strategy. And so I would literally live in the neighborhood. I, um, I, it's, it's kind of complicated because I, right after I made this picture, I got a job in Maine. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, I didn't know I had made this picture, and I didn't, you know, it's a pretty good picture, I think, but I didn't know how good it was until I got to Maine. After I drove across the Skyway, literally with tears running down my cheek, I'm leaving Chicago. I thought, like, I'm, you know, <laughs> in this godforsaken place. <laughs> and I, you know, and I, I uh, you know, that's where I met my wife Anne. Yeah. <laughs> So they, they, they had it upside. <laughs> um, but as soon as, you know, she can attest this, as soon as graduation was over, my car was packed, I was heading back to Chicago. And a lot of it was because in that dark, the, the, during the winter in that dark mall, I filmed my shot that summer, a lot of the best pictures were from this neighborhood. And, um, and you know, so I just kept coming back by like, some migratory bird. Seasons would change. I'd be back, and then I got this grant to allow me to take a whole year off, and I spent the whole year here. And um, in some ways, it was good that I wasn't here all the time, because I was, I would, I would, I really would, would photograph, you know, with, uh, like, with this kind of white heat. Um, you know, I knew I would, would only had two months, and I would, I would be up to six o'clock in the morning. You know, uh, I did, I did, I mean, I shot way too much. I did shoot too much. It's possible to shoot too much. I mean, I just repeated myself, for, you know. But then I get to go back and look at this and go, what was I thinking? Look at this. I just made the same picture over and over again. It's a really stupid picture, but, you know. And then it would help me kind of get some distance, re recalibrate, you know, and actually have a kind of plan. I need more of this, more of that, you know. And it went to us. It was immersion, you know. Uh, separation, commercial separation, you know, and I kept kind of get to look at it, do this, look at it, do this. And then I, you know, moved back in 2000. And how was it finished? I mean, I, why, you know, and, and as I used to say, you know, it was, it's just exactly what you're going to be part of that in this, this, this goofy neighborhood forever. <laughs> um, and it, the neighborhood really changed. It stopped being this uh, authentic place. You know, it really, I, I you know, it's in some ways I don't want to, uh, the, uh, it's, it's a complicated thing to say, but it kind of became kind of multicultural and it just seemed to lose a certain kind of identity and it seemed to lose a certain kind of uh, energy. Um, and it just felt like it was open, you know. It, it became a safer neighborhood. So I mean, there's definitely good things about that. But as a place that was inspiring. inspiring. Then plus, and then also I've already made probably the Bye.
questions at the end where I didn't talk about my favorite style. Just, you know. We'll get to your favorite color. <laughs> we all know the inside the actor studios that all our fantasy would be on there. Be <laughs> so when I took documentary photography, whenever anyone in the class would get stuck, you would always tell them to focus on a picture problem. So you may say, change the camera format, please. You're shooting 35 millimeters, switch to medium format, or jump to large format. Or photograph with a flash or without a flash, or focus on some kind of technical or stylistic element of making pictures that allowed you to focus on something else than whatever ideas were, were bogging you down. Um, how do, do you do this yourself? And, you know, how do these technical or stylistic challenges help you work through some of the things that you're, you're struggling with when you're working on a project for 15 years? It's always good when you break the problem down into a kind of picture problem. I mean, I don't think that solves all problems, doesn't it? But it is, it's great when you can get down to the craft of image making. I mean, because after all these years, that's kind of what I'm supposed to be good at, you know, is knowing how to solve certain kind of problems. And, um, but I don't think it's any different for a painter, a musician, you know, how do you make, how do you write that bridge? You know, how do you get to light that scene? How, how do you kind of craft that sentence, you know? Um, I mean, all of the, everyone who's great at their craft knows how to use that craft to to massage different kinds of meanings out of the same subject, you know, the same melody, the same you know, um, subject, the same uh, whatever it is, you know. And, um, and I, I love photography. I mean, I, 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 I think that's why I photograph all the time, whether I, whether I make good pictures or not, because it's a pleasure to be in the world make a picture. So I love it when I can say, okay, um, I want to photograph, okay, here's a picture problem. Here's a real picture problem that I have right now. I, uh, I am for, trying to photograph in uh, uh, churches on the west side. And that's a really interesting uh, uh, challenge. Because I don't want to photograph during the service. Uh, I get this big old camera and it's disruptive and it seems disrespectful. I want to make these portraits uh, of folks on that day, which is, I think, an important day. Uh, I think a church is an important place. Um, but I come into churches, and I can love the congregation. I can love the pastor. I'm truly inspired by the things they say. I can, um, but if the light sucks, you know, I can't make a picture out of that. That's a picture problem. You know, I don't care how great my subject is. I don't care how, how uh, inspirational. The pastor is. If I can't make it into a visually interesting thing, it doesn't. It doesn't exist for me. You know, it exists for me uh, intellectually. It exists for me experientially. I learn from it. But I'm, I'm just. I want to make pictures that are great. And if, if those that if that clay isn't there, you know, if I'm making a pot and the clay doesn't hold together, it's not going to be a pot. I don't care what you, you know how great it, the form is that you have in mind for it or not. You know. So I'm trying to photograph. I'm, I just found a church I'm really, really excited about it. <clears throat> three weeks ago. And it, one, one of the things I like most about it is the, the life in that church. You know, I've looked at a hundred churches, and I've sat through hundreds of uh, Baptist services, which is no small thing. I mean, they all go for three hours. And so, um, it's, uh, uh, and, uh, but I'm really looking for the right place, and, and I am... Uh, um, I, I'm hoping that this is this is a great place because I'm trying to I want to photograph lots of people at once instead of this uh, this this kind of this static individual in the middle. That's a picture problem. How do I recomplicate the picture by by photographing more than one person? I just made a picture of this choir at this church that I, I really like a lot. I think um, yeah, it's kind of I'm trying to do more of this. That's what I'm trying to do. It's a picture problem. How do I get away from a single portrait? How do I photograph these people who look fat, just amazing? And how do you make more than one person work in a picture? You know, because um, one person, one person in a group of twelve that's smiling in this weighing way will kill emotionally kill the whole picture. I mean, that's a picture problem, right? Uh, and so I'm playing, doing a lot now. Where I'm playing with motion and I'm doing a lot of directing. I, I, I wish I promised. 
by the JPEG is picture. Um, but it's like this. I'm glad you put this one up there because I have this. I get some people who are singing. I'm telling some people not to sing. You know, it's a real. It's become this real. Um, it's it's real like a modern net. I mean, I'm the choreographer, and, and it's and it's great to kind of be there with like 15 people and figuring which should be in the middle, which shouldn't. Who's best when they move? Who smiles badly all the time? So you should be singing. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, and where's the best light? And the great thing about this church is it's so big and it's got so many rooms. Each room is, I, I'm, I'm sitting in the surface and I, I am, you know, listening to the word. <laughs> but I'm really also thinking, you know, okay, today, where's this, what room is going to be best today? You know, and I'm watching what happens uh, with the light. I know in the morning, which, which, which kind of, you know, I'm really kind of figuring it out. I'm turning that church into a personal studio. I have a meeting with the pastor tomorrow at 11. And we're going to talk about this project, and, um, you know, uh, I've only been to three services. I've already photographed his daughter. She was getting baptized two weeks ago. So that's a picture problem, right? How do you, I mean, how do you work this, 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 this situation? So it's not that so that I'm, you know, exploiting them, whatever that means, but um, so that it really works out all around, you know. And so I'm going to talk to the pastor about, like, what I'm doing. You know, what are the limits of that kind of activity? What would be good for them? Um, there's a corridor. I think it would be a great place to be putting the pictures up. I actually think this is a, a place where, you know, I could be putting the, I always bring the pictures back anyways. All these pictures that you see of these folks, everyone has their picture. Even in the barrio, which they look kind of candid, you know. Uh, most, some of them are candid, but I know, I know most of the people in the, in the pictures, that everyone gets their pictures anyway. But I kind of think it would be interesting now to, because I'm, I'm totally psyched. Um, you know, about turning a room in that church into a place where this ongoing flow of pictures is happening. And so I don't just get an individual response, which I always get. And people always like the pictures, actually. I can make some pictures that are, are, are fairly hot. And it's amazing to me. I've never had anyone say, I hate that picture. Go ever show it. Is that girl with a shopping cart? That's a, this is a little aside, but I was afraid that family was going to be really offended by that picture. And um, and I remember not saying the contact sheets back. Um, this is a big aside. I'm really going off here, but you can reel me in in a sec. Right? This, that's your job. Okay. That's right. Um, and I remember, I really, you know, it's one of the toughest pictures I've ever made, but I really did picture that. And, um, and if they hated the picture, the parents hated the picture, I knew the family. I knew that, so this, this, is a, this is important actually, is that um, I, there's no way I could, I could show it. Now legally I could show it, there's nothing uh, unlawful about showing a picture that I made in public. But you all have to come up with your own kind of moral standards here. And, um, and when you're dealing with the world of, of folks who start off as strangers and, and don't and stop being strangers because you get to know them, you owe a certain kind of responsibility to, to them. And um, if they hit the picture, uh, I was just not going to be I mean, I was still guilty, but not I feel terrible, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really, you know, I get superstitious. I would think that was being inviting all kinds of bad comments, you know. And uh, I brought this picture back. I made a huge print of it just to kind of hedge my bets to kind of, you know, increase the chance that they're going to be impressed with me. I bring this picture back. Uh, I remember it was on a, at a trailer. They lived in a trailer right, off, right next to this, these tires. And the whole family was there. The uh, daughter Bonnie, the son Clyde, was there. Uh, was, uh, and this is their little sister, and uh, and I unfurled this picture on the table. And I remember there was this really pregnant minute. There were no one said anything. I just thought, okay, I really, I totally scotched the air and done. And uh, it's too bad. But then the guy started laughing. You know, uh, he said, "She's always like this." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I thought, you know. I mean, that's told, that tells me a lot, you know, we, uh, we worry so much about how these pictures, how they represent folks, but um, and it's important to worry about that, you know, I, I truly believe that. But, you know, most cases people know what things look like, and they're not offended by seeing, <laughs> seeing that version of, of them, you know, and um, so, and then pictures really aren't really about what they seem to be about, so I'm, I'm just to let you in a little secret. She, she looks like she's screaming her head off. I mean, the picture is redolent with, like, abandonment and uh, neglected child, and, you know. Um, and, but she's just yawning. 
<laughs> and I say that, and I know I've just killed that picture for for you guys. <laughs> but I'm making I'm making a point. You know, don't trust that pictures are are really out of what they seem to be about. They're only about what they seem to be about. And if they seem to be about something interesting, that's good. You know. Okay, so back to this church on my side. <laughs> so you're talking about working in, in uh, a sort of directorial mode. Is that a new way of working, or is that how you always approach that? It's, it's, it's <coughs> got to be a, a bigger, bigger part of it. Anytime you put a, pic, a camera on a bike, anytime you, you ask someone, can I take a picture? Um, any kind of candidness, any kind of like unmitigated uh, way of ex experiencing that person is gone. Um, so something else has to happen, and, um, and so conversation happens, you know? and uh, that's the advantage of using, this is why I went to this, this view camera, because um, one, Carrie uh, Callan once said, if you board change cameras, there's another little interesting photograph of the picture, we should probably, it should change cameras, it changes everything. I was getting a little bored, I knew how to make these pictures, I thought, pretty well at this point, and I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing that, you know. So I like those more static pictures. I think a view camera would be a great way to, to get at that. But the kind of unexpected surprise of the view camera for me was how slow it was and how great it was that it was that slow. Uh, it buys all kinds of time for me to get used to them my subjects, my, and my subjects to get used to me. Uh, it, uh, I, it buys all this kind of, I, you know, awkward putting up and jump like this and talking, but the whole time I'm looking at them to see if something really kind of uh, fresher, more kind of uh, ingenuous kinds of appears, feels real. Yeah. But then you can kind of get people to do that. It's funny how you get people sometimes to recreate things that you've seen in a fleeting way. And then sometimes we'll just do things that are completely surprising to you. And then the next step is you bring the pictures back. Now, that picture that, can we go to the picture that we did? That, um, the group. That is the uh, Easter Children's Choir at the Jackson Baptist Church. Just so you know. I mean, that picture wasn't possible without photographing there a number of times and bringing the pictures back. It was so, fun. so it's important to do, I think, in life what you say you're going to do. It's really important for me when I'm in a community where I could nominally be considered a stranger. Uh, that you do what you say you do. And that being, you know, so bringing pictures back when you say you've gone through is really important. It's amazing how uh, impressed people are by that. Um, <clears throat> and that, uh, you know, selfishly though, uh, tactically that leads sometimes to better pictures. You know, so I'm willing to, it's like, <laughs> you know, you get to give something, you get to, to get something. You know, and I don't mind giving a lot to give one good picture. You know, you know, one picture a month is enough. But I'll give it. So I was talking about something that you, you touched on a little bit about what the pictures do show, what they don't show, and what your responsibility as a photographer is to, um, to your subjects. You're, you're, you're not a member of. Of these communities, you're, you're an outsider. How? So, so, okay. <laughs> 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 All right. So why am I an outsider? Yeah. <laughs> you, okay. You didn't. You know. You didn't grow up there. You're not. You're not. I grew up in this country. <laughs> <laughs> in a very, lo in a very local way. <laughs> Collection of articles you know, 
came around that I thought in like 1979, didn't it? But I, I ran across it in like 1980. And she wrote these really kind of provocative things in there. And it was really, it was uh, a challenge to the whole, the, the whole medium. But, and she said a lot of things that, to me, made me furious. You know, I just felt she was so wrong. She said a lot of things that I thought were, were great. But she was a, she's a great writer, and she was a, a, a person that needed to be um, taken seriously. It, but what, uh, she said two things that really uh, struck a chord with me, and this kind of gets at what you're saying. And it's, this is the back, background to that kind of question. Because no one before then was asking those questions. No one was saying you're an outsider. Diane Arbus couldn't have made any of those pictures that she made before Song had, you know. They were all been considered grossly exploitive. Um, Bruce Davidson's pictures, he's 100 Street, you know, uh, uh, pre Sontag, you know. Yeah, uh, after, yeah, post, post Sontag, uh, those pictures are deeply disturbing in a lot of ways. Um, <clears throat> but they weren't at the time. People just thought, oh, great, look how gritty and real this is. <coughs> Did everyone know what I'm talking about? Bruce Davidson's 100 Street. Um, but she said two things. She said, Every photographer is a tourist in another person's reality. I mean, I remember that. I don't remember this today. Like I, like I first read that, I was like, oh, God, that's such a blow. <laughs> One second. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, God, you're so right. And she's so wrong. You know, and she was wrong. I mean, she wrote this book that recanted a lot of that stuff, the last book she wrote. Um, you know, but, you know, we, she said a lot of things. Without even using the word exploitation, they're all different, more sophisticated, intellectual ways of saying exploitation, exploitation, exploitation. Every picture turns, this is another phrase that just stuck in my psyche, every picture, picture turns of the subject into the other. Not the other being this exotic, you know, cause for entertainment, right? And you can look at Davidson's pictures, you can certainly look at a lot of Arbus's pictures, and I like some of Davidson's pictures, I like a lot of Arbus's pictures, and that's true with those pictures. Um, but I, you know, and that to me, this is going to be a long answer. Uh, that to me, and Craig, it's important. It's something I thought a lot about. So um, that to me, to uh, me, led a whole generation of photographers away from exploring the world. Mm -hmm. That's when we saw Sally Mann happening. Uh, we saw Dan Golden. We saw Tim <coughs> Barney. We saw Larry Sultan. We saw Philip Rothkorsha. These are all people who turned to their family. Uh, you know, when they were super fabulously wealthy, like Tina Barney's, they were dramatic. When they were kind of super dysfunctional and rehab half the time, they were they were entertaining because they were Nan Goldens, you know. Uh, Sally Mans were, you know, just beautiful. And, but they led a whole, all these photographers, art photographers, away from looking at the world into their the navel of their own family and friends. Like, that automatically would make them less exploitive. <laughs> and it doesn't, really. Uh, those pictures are, it just could be accused or just as capable of being exploitive as any picture of some stranger, you know? Um, I, I, I'm not that interested in my family. <laughs> you know, I, 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 uh, I, I, I love them all, you know, but they're just not that interesting to me as a photographic subject, so I was, I was kind of stuck. Like, you either be, either be thought of as kind of perpetually exploitive or, or give it up, you know, or make, you know, bland pictures of Thanksgiving. Um, so, I really spent a, a big part of my career trying to solve that problem. And, um, I'm stuck with being fascinated with exploring, the, especially the urban fabric, and coming across areas that I think can become my studio for, for seven years. No. But how to do that and not make the pictures that are available to the, the to the E word, you know, exploitive. That's that's a problem. I don't think you know, no one wants to be considered be thought of as exploitive. That's just a chilling kind of uh, concept, you know. So my strategies have, I mean, really, what you're looking at is a couple strategies to solve that problem. How to be immersed with so-called strangers um, and not make pictures that are, um, you know, turns them into this exotic otherness, you know. So my strategy for, it's not very sophisticated, my solution. Uh, with Barrio, it was just to spend this ridiculous amount of time there so you get past being even yourself enamored with difference, you know. You, you try and get to the point where it's all familiar, you know. And, um, and I used to say, and I know it's a kind of, um, it's, uh, kind of a, a pretense, but where you, 
where you're photographing from the inside out instead of from the outside looking in. That was my goal. What the inside is, what it is, the look. <laughs> I knew what it was to look from the outside in. You know, um, but it's like you know, it's like jumping into the middle of the lake. You try and get to a place where you lose all definition of what the edges are, and that just takes time. And fortunately, if you're having fun and you're making pictures that are satisfying too, it doesn't matter. Okay. And then, you know, I did that at the men's club just by showing up. I mean, just, no one asked those, those questions of me when I was photographing in these white men's clubs. But, frankly, those were as alien, that scene was as alien to me as, as anything else. Um, they, I really had, you know, theoretically had no more in common with them than anything else I thought about. But, again, I, I ended up loving a lot of these guys. Not this place, this was, <laughs> <laughs> this, was a, this was a place in, uh, the North End, which is a kind of awesome. yeah, yeah, really kind of a mafioso. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The one, the wrong guy walked in, and I couldn't be, I couldn't photograph him. <laughs> but you know, so you get the place where you get it all becomes familiar. But I just, you know, I just don't believe. I, I think that these differences are overstated. I think that it's important to be respectful and pay attention to them. And my strategy now is to, with this view camera, is to, on top of spending a lot of time, is to involve this process where they have, they participate as much in what the pictures are about as they do. So you can't look at these pictures ever of these that I'm making now and not be aware that every person in the picture, you know, is participating in what the picture's about. They're looking at the camera. It's all very static. They're looking at me with the same degrees of scrutiny as I'm looking at them. And it's all cool. It's all interesting. Um, Shabandra, this picture is the, I must have photographed her at least seven times before I made this picture. And I bring pictures back to her, and, you know, and, and, and this was the best one, uh, I think, you know. Uh, so it's about building relationships. <coughs> so then this is, so this is something you can do I could. Okay. So it's, it's going to take it to another level. Okay. What, do you, what do you want to ask? I, I want to ask, you know, so, so this is something that comes up more when people see your picture. That's not something that comes up when you're in the community. Never, never within the community. Um, you know, um, and I think this concern, this kind of political correctness, is kind of quieted down in the critical discourse of photography, somewhat. Um, it was, it, you know, it was, it was tough for a while. It was important, totally important. Um, it helped. Mm -hmm. It helped me to do something. In the world. So, the for instance, no, no kind of quotes about Mexican culture. There's no, you know, uh, typical. It's nothing national geographic. There's no Mexican flags in any of the pictures. You know, I, I, you know, it's those kinds of things that would make the work feel authoritative about that community. So, those are strategies you take to kind of pull that kind of false authority out of the work and make it feel more personal. So that makes sense. So what do you want to do next time? Question. The question? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it, it doesn't come up in the interactions you have. No. With people, no, no. And I always bring back these pictures, and they, and they folks love them. I mean, they do. I mean, I don't know. And they discuss. They're good. Give us a comment. Go for This whole thing is going to my head right here, you know. So. But, you know, it, it all comes, it, you know, what, what's the world view that allows me to, this is, this is the question I think you're trying to ask, is what, what is it uh, that kind of uh, um, fuels this kind of, this um, interest or, uh, not fearlessness, but this kind of disregard for those concerns going into communities I theoretically don't belong in, you know. Um, photograph on the west side is a, it, that is a loaded situation. I mean, you know, I, I understand that. Um, but you know, uh, you know, it gets back to this is why I brought this in because I wrote this down, and this is uh, I don't want to get all um, intense here, but um, you know, I was sitting in this service that I, this church I was talking about uh, three weeks ago, and one of the first readings that I heard uh, sitting in this service was from First uh, Corinthians. <laughs> Now, I'm not a biblical scholar. I mean, I'm, truth be told, I just bought uh, the, the uh, Idiot's Guide to the Bible. <laughs> so, I'm, I mean, I was raised by two 
uh, rigid, religiously atheistic parents. You know, I mean, it was almost a, it was a passion of theirs, so I'm kind of catching up in some ways. But when I heard First Corinthians, and it really is written, written by this other Paul, you know, um, it, it said something that really, it's just, it was really well said like 2,000 years ago. And so this is what, you know, I'm going to read this. Um, yeah. Uh, now this is so. Uh, this is a letter to the Corinthians body. By Paul. For the body is one, and have many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow a more abundant honor. There should be no schism in the body, and that the members should have the same care for one another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members be, be rejoice with it. I mean, I think that's pretty profound. And so I really don't really, I trust these, these, these artificial divisions that we, I think, as a population construct between one group and another group. Um, I really believe in property. I mean, that's an illusion. This is so-called owning a piece of the earth. I mean, I, I play along, but I, I don't believe in that. I, just because they, you know, just because we function that way doesn't mean it's real. Um, I mean, I'm not naive. I grew up in Boston in the 70s, 60s and 70s. That was a city torn with, with racial strife and busing. And, uh, you know, I went, to, did my parents to, to do some kind of church. They did the least kind of church they could possibly go to, and that's Unitarianism. <laughs> and, uh, and, and every service was about uh, civil rights and stuff. And so that was hugely formative for me. Um, so, you know, I know these tensions exist in there, but um, I do believe we are part of a greater whole, each one of us. I do believe we are brothers and sisters. And, um, and I think if you believe that, the most radical thing you can do is is to is to act like it, you know, and that's what I do. I go in like I don't think I'm a, uh, I don't belong. I feel like I belong wherever, whenever I want to. I, I want to go is where I belong, you know. But I have to. You have to be respectful. You have to be. You have to honor that interaction. So I just get through that here. <laughs> I think that's a good spot to end. Do you, do you have anything else you want to add? No, yeah, that's. Uh... Well, then I have I have one one really easy question. For you. So, as you know, this the structure of this exhibition, we asked uh, various people from the Chicago art community to nominate an artist for the show, and so I want to know if you have any opportunity to nominate. Oh, well, I mean, it's tough to say with my my wife and me right now. I nominated. <laughs> she, you know, and now she's a she's a great fan, and uh, I would nominate her. But there's there's lots of other folks too that I, I you know. This show, <laughs> this show is great for for who's in it, absolutely, and it's uh, and there's lots of people who, who belong in here too, but you know, for limited space. I'm a huge admirer of Jim Lewis's. Uh, so those are two. Can Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alright, um, let's open it up to the audience. So, one image in there that doesn't, uh, it's not forced. That's the, uh, from this men's club. Is that it? It's with the, with the easy does it. Oh, 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 oh. Right. This is not a picture that I have to have, but... Um, uh, I mean, I, this is the kind of imagery that I, I'm drawn to. I, I'm really... Uh, now, I, I disassociate from people, so I, I'm drawn to surfaces. And I, I just really thought that was... You know who that is, don't you? Uh, I'm guessing it's Martin Luther King. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, and, and but, but the... Yeah, it's because of this image that the work is kind of temporarily right now. I'm not so sure about this, but it's, uh, if you go to my website, the pictures fall under this portfolio called We Shall, and it comes from that picture. And you can imagine what it was said underneath. So. 
We know I, uh, that, that picture that's on the wall actually is kind of part of this, but I, I do make all these pictures, but for the last seven years I've been making all of, I've been making a lot of pictures like this as well, which are yeah. details of um, surfaces um, uh, inside people's homes. A lot of, there are a lot of pictures that I've made inside um, uh, the public housing buildings that were on the west side before they came down, and they home their lot of gardens and most of the green. I have been through literally every single room of, of every single high rise they can bring green at least once uh, before they come down. Uh, that's true of, of many of the buildings in Canyon Corner too, and the only was at Downing and Lake Street. And, uh, and I'm, like, I'm really interested in these kind of uh, surface that really are like paintings to me. Um, and uh, almost everything I have photographed, you know, like that, uh, is gone, you know. Uh, it's kind of like a little side thing, and I, I made a little art, artist book of all these little details, just seeing if they kind of could be together as, as one group of work. And so I had a show at Data Gallery like a year and a half ago. I had them all mixed up, and they looked a little odd with these other pictures, so I put them all together. Now I'm thinking about reading them again. I'm still thinking a lot about them. But there's a lot of pictures that I think like this. I promise I won't quote the Bible anymore. <laughs> uh, do you still keep in touch with anyone from the barrio? Yeah. Yep. Uh, not that many. Um, uh, there, uh, there are a few that that I, I I feel guilty that I'm not better in touch with with some of them, frankly, honestly. Uh, but we were at a um, at a uh, barbecue summer or something we've got a neighborhood of the neighbors changed a lot. There's one person um, that I kept pretty close touch with, the guy who's looking out of the window, right? That's, his name is Junior. Uh, unfortunately, he's in Cook County Jail. So, But I called his sister, Blanca, occasionally to see how he's doing. I mean, that family I was really close to. I was, um, I went by there and they've moved, I think, and you know, I, I, so, but I was there for dinner. That's when this picture was made. And, uh, you know, there's a story behind you, you know, all of these pictures that he had just been shot 14 times uh, three months before that. Those little holes in his abdomen and his arm um, are, are part of that. <clears throat> so he's kind of rarely looking at what's going on up there. That's, that's my camera bag, the little corner. I see the little yellow peeking out of it. That's like my film. So oh, that's how I'm woven together in things to be. <clears throat> Another question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, how do you approach your portraits as opposed to your landscapes? Because they're so different, and I, and I love both of them. And you tend to be uh, have focused more on portraits than landscapes, but I feel like you're more your current stuff is more landscapes. And just kind of wondering the difference. Uh, well, they they're different. I mean, they look different. They just are, and it's good to have things be different. You know. Uh, you know, that's, that's a great idea about not having a clear idea about what you're doing, <laughs> is that um, you don't end up doing the same thing over and over again. You're always thinking, well, what would that look like? What would that look like? Um, you know, uh, and so, um, it, so uh, you know, I, I'm just interested in painting uh, anyways. I mean, I was, if I had the kind of uh, patience, um, I, I tried to be a painter. That was, it was awful at it, but I think a big part of it was I just couldn't, wasn't the kind of person. One like my wife, who could go to a room with a cup of coffee at 8 o'clock in the morning and just say, okay, I'm going to be here all day. <laughs> you know, and that's like, it seems like prison to me. And, uh, but, you know, but I have spent as much time looking at painting uh, as I kind of educated myself about the visual arts, certainly as much, if not more, as I have looked at photography. And so, this is a kind of my frustrated painter person coming out, actually. Uh, it's these, looking at these surfaces. I mean, I really think, I have some pictures I just think are brilliant paintings, paintings that really are as good as, a, and this is possible to say, but there's, there's one I have that I think uh, the Cooney would kill for, you know. Um, <coughs> I'm still putting ink in a rectangle on a page. 
And it ha all of it has to work. I mean, it has to work in terms of light, color, space, texture, degree of focus. You have to have a kind of hierarchy of interest. I mean, that's as true for a portrait as it is for a landscape or a detail. It's still, it, you're still pushing ink around in the rectangle. And that sounds like boring and limited, but it's, it's an endlessly fascinating thing to me. So whether I do it with a person in there, or something that's shaped like a person, or whether it's you know, swatches of color or patterns, you know, I, I just think it's all kind of the same, you know, it's still related. Because <clears throat> it's really not a person that you're looking at. This is really not a wall. It's just light that's bouncing all this stuff. On your website, you can have your space temporarily to put up any of your images. But when you are looking at a gallery and submission, is there a criteria that you use? You mentioned the data, a data gallery where you mix things up. Are you more inclined to opt for better known photographs or something new or lesser known? What criteria do you use when you're building things up into it? Well, I just went for the best pictures. <laughs> but are your best pictures the ones that are best known? Well, you know, it's, it's obviously a dialogue with the gallery and the photos. Well, given that all things are decided upon and it comes down to just you know, the images, general. Well, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, it really is. It's a negotiation. Some, you know, some spaces you have cut one if you do anything you want with. Uh, that last show had data. There were some pictures that um, I say <laughs> that, that Stephen data hated. You know, and, and they're pretty good pictures, actually. <laughs> but it's his face, and he's, you know, he's in the business of making a living. He's going to sell those things, and if he can't be confident or really talk to his client about his pictures in a way that's uh, sincere or, you know, enthusiastic, you know, why put them in there, you know? Um, but we'll, you know, we'll talk about what to do next, you know, and um, unfortunately, I don't have those conversations that often because, you know, I don't, I don't show that often every other year or something. Yeah? Um, I was wondering, the blue boy photograph, um, what was going on there, and what was going on behind it? What's going on is kind of what appears to be going on. There's a kid standing there, and these guys gesticulating behind him, right? You want, you want to know the backstory behind it? Um, um, you know, I was photographing these kids that were found. I mean, I just moved to Maine. I left pills in behind. I was, you know, desperate for anything that seemed to move with any energy. <laughs> and, you know, Mainers aren't particularly demonstrative people. You know, I can say they're safely. My mom is from Maine, half my family from Maine. I kind of know what I'm talking about. And, um, but these kids were bouncing on this mattress that had been, this was next to a boy's mom. And, uh, that seemed kind of interesting. Where's the trying to do something with it? But it was interesting that this kid actually, it seemed to like float in from the side. Like his, you know, like his feet didn't even touch the ground. That's kind of like my feeling about that kid. He just kind of, and he didn't, and he had this kind of expressionless, I mean, I didn't, this is what, what he looked like. And um, he had these eyes that were impenetrable, you know, uh, and he, there was a coolness to his demeanor, there was a coolness to his, his palette, the white you know, skin and his pale blue shirt. And I was like, oh my god, this is way more interesting than what is theoretically more interesting over here, you know. Don't move. Don't, you know, just, you know. And then they, you know, I made some pictures, but these kids couldn't bear to be not in the picture, not to be, so they had to be in the background. And so that's how you know how something can, can evolve, and, and so and it, it led to something that I can never. This is this is why um, I mean, that's why I love photography. You're always being surprised things that you never could have you know anticipated or planned. I'm, I'm just not that clever to kind of think of this in advance. And, and there's a whole movement in photography where it's all kind of choreographed and it's tableau kind of photography. Um, I just I just don't have great great stories to illustrate and get actors to, to illustrate for me. I just think life is way more surprising all by itself. To, so it's a tension between his coolness, which is amplified by these kids being very aggressive, you know, so it's even magnified by that, you know. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Ye
Um, you said before that you take pictures of things that just didn't treat you specifically. In what ways do, like, when you take a picture, what kind of, like, emotional release does that have for you? Like, you know, in, in art, like, especially, like, I think, like, musics and musicians and poets, like, you know, and raw emotional release, do you feel like you have that when you take a picture? Wow, that is, that's a great question. Um... <clears throat> You know, what, what I was saying recently to uh, my grad students uh, is that, uh, no, I don't have to picture and go, oh my god, I just hit the bullseye, and I'm like jumping up and down, and my car, like, like moving around, and I'm driving away, going, you know, <laughs> you know, matching dollar signs, all this, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, but there is, the thing I love about what I do, is that it's a, it's a kind of process that um, that um, rewards me whether I actually have good pictures on the day you know the end of the day or not. You know that's what I was saying to someone else. You got to think of your process as like it's your own little art factory, and you're, there are going to be days where you don't make good things, but you want to show up the next day regardless. It's still challenging, intriguing to you being in this process of doing this thing, whether it's rewarded with good pictures or not. And the thing about my process that is absolutely rewarding to me is I get to meet strangers all the time. I mean, for some people that would be a deal breaker. For me, that is the whole kind of selfish pleasure of what I do. I get to meet people all the time. And it's, uh, and it's always, it's just such a, it's such a pleasure. But I know, I mean, I was photographing yesterday. And I was bringing pictures back because I was, doing it and trying to see if there was more opportunity to make better pictures. But then this someone at the very end of the day walked in and she, she saw what I was doing. She actually wanted to then be part of the pictures. And oh my God, it was like, I, I didn't have that feeling all day long. But that was, that was, it was like, oh my, please God, don't move. Really, I mean, no, I mean it. Stop moving your foot. No, really, this is, this is amazing. This is amazing. You, look, you know, I mean, that, that was, you know, that's when you, so, but you know, you can have a feeling and sometimes look at the pictures and go, you know, not good as <laughs> But there is, you know, there's, there's a high degree of success with those experiences when the other when the other ones you walk away going, no, oh, something, why did I think of this? You know, you're driving away and going, why did I think of that? You know you didn't make the best picture. My little money is a little better. I don't as an artist, you have that one that got away that you just knew. Do you have one? No. 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 <laughs> just your best picture. That's gonna be the shortest end all night. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the days I don't photograph them might be the days that one got away. And that's what I say to myself. For you know, uh, you know, I don't know. The light is great, but it's gonna be great. And I, you know, it's, it's one of the, I mean, you have photographic skills, but you also have things about your personality that are, are good, you know, and um, that's good, right? And uh, just for me, that's, that's not a, I mean, uh, how would you, how would you tell other people to do before you, you know, I don't, think, I don't think everyone needs to have that experience. I think they should find what is the thing that's really, you know, most satisfying for them to pay attention to, to, to get accessible to. For example, when I do see people very interesting, I don't want to push because it feels like sure. it would be a benefit. Well, you know, I, I, uh, 
I do this thing where I'll go by, I'll drive by a situation and I'll go, oh, that's, that looks great, that's pretty interesting. And then I'll, you know, but it looks, seems a little sketchy or something, or I have this little voice that goes, man, I don't know, that would the energy of. And now, this just happened the other day too, actually, this happens all the time. You know, I go down the block and I go, wait a second, how do I know this is not going to be good? <laughs> you know, and then I go, wait, there's one way to find out. And that's to turn around and, and ask, you know, and if they say no, they say no, it's fine, you know. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to, to me. Um, but people can say no, and you know that if you ask again, you really are being obnoxious, you know. And, and you, just, you just know. I mean, uh, some people will say no, but they, they don't want you to leave. They're going to ask you something else, you know. <laughs> So it's a, it's a dance. It's absolutely a dance. And I can tell with some people that no is negotiable. Uh, I, I'm, a kind of, I'm kind of pushy, you know, and I will go, uh, well, you know, I'll stop, I'll stop, you know, sweetening the deal. You know, I'll go, uh, well, I, you know, the thing that really helps me in Chicago now is that I teach at Columbia College. And I can say to everyone, well, you know what, I teach at Columbia College. And, uh, and, I'm, and this is the wonderful things about Columbia is everyone. It's the, you know, does, it's not a class specific college. I mean, any of uh, uh, has heard about it. I rarely run into someone say, I don't know what Columbia College is. And I'm a little bit, I just teach at Columbia. I'm just doing this for my own thing. And I'll whip up my, uh, I probably use my business card more than any executive at the school. Because I am, they're flying out of my hands. And go, you know, and then they'll go, oh, you know, they'll, something else will happen. And they're not putting it into it. And then, and if I, the, the conversation will allow me to really decide whether I really want to pursue this or not, you know. I'm figuring it out also, to let you know. But the thing, my ace in the hole is this. I have uh, a box of 11 by 14 prints in my car that I'm always in the process of returning to people. I also have a box of contact sheets, four by five contact sheets that I'm always returning. So I'll say it's like this. Look, can I show you some picture? Uh, and if they say yes, you can show me, I'd love to see some pictures. I know it's, um, it's like dating, you know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll show them the pictures, and, and they, uh, they uh, this all, you know, if it, it gets to that point, they often it's just a guess, it's not this complicated, you know. Uh, this thing, situation yesterday I'm describing about where I was worried about these three guys that were hanging out. They were like, hey, yeah, sounds great. <laughs> you know, so, okay, cool. I mean, have, can I show you some pictures? No, let's, let's just do this. You know. But I'll show them pictures and they'll go, yeah, those are great. Those are beautiful. And how much do I have like to pay for them? I'm like, you don't pay me. I really respect free. This is what I'm doing. But, you know, if someone says no, I'm totally respectful of that. One thing that helped me, uh, you know, one thing that helped me a lot uh, as part of the business that nothing to do with photography is um, I went to college in Oregon. And I grew up in Boston. Um, and we, I came from a real working class country. We didn't have a lot of money flying me back and forth. So I had to get myself cross country uh, a lot of times, with very little money. Uh, I hopped freight trains cross country twice. Um, I hitchhiked cross country uh, a couple times, all, all the way a couple times, halfway a couple times. Um, I mean, as a parent, I would let, never leave my son. Not like, hey dad, I'll go back to school. I would never leave my son at Route 128 in Boston and say, okay, right when you get there. <laughs> but that's what they would do. They'd take me to the highway, they'd leave me, and I'm like, hey, I, I learned, I, I actually think that I learned more from that experience than I ever did in any class in any school I went to. Um, I learned how, I learned, I, did, I learned to uh, get over whatever leaders ideas I had about myself versus others. I learned that everyone I, I meet is actually as interesting and as, as, as I am. Um, I learned how to read people. You, when you take shopping across country, you, you learn how to read people instantly. You just have to, you know, it's a survival technique. You also want to be entertaining to them because they, you want them to, to be grateful that they put you up. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a real life experience that has served me probably as much as anything else I've ever been told about. about it because it's, it's just a great thing. But then I also learned that all these people are really great. I learned all about these, these truckers and these teenagers and Kentucky and, and, and all, this, you know, all these amazing stories. <laughs> I mean, I got a lot of interesting stories. 
the health. Let's take one more. There is one. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate uh, you all coming out.